All right, let's get started. So we're going to cover sound, chapter 13 mostly, but we're going to jog back and do a little bit from chapter 12, which was covering waves. So let's jog back. This is part of chapter 12 we should cover. Let's go to page 457 in our books. So we're talking about the speed of a wave. Okay, so at the bottom of 456, the speed of a mechanical wave is consistent for any given medium. For example, at a concert, sound waves from a different instrument reach your ears at the same moment, even when the frequency of sound waves are different. Thus, although the frequency and wavelengths of sounds produced by each instrument may be different, the product of the two, which is the speed of the sound waves, is always the same. When a mechanical wave's frequency is increased, its wavelength must decrease in order for its speed to remain constant. The speed of a wave changes only when the speed moves from one medium to another or when certain properties of the medium are varied. And so we have this um, equation, V, velocity equals frequency times wavelength. So let's just go through quickly. Let's just quickly go through number, fi number 5A. So we're talking, we're trying to understand that as frequency goes up, wavelength is going to go down and that the speed of a wave within a certain medium is going to remain the same. If you look at the top or towards the top of page 457 in the box there at the solution, V equals 343 meters per second. That just happens to be the speed of sound. So in that sample question, they were talking about a piano at 264 hertz. That's the frequency of this particular note. The wavelength is 1.3 meters. If you multiply those together, you get the speed of sound, 343. Number five, a tuning fork produces a sound with the frequency of 256 hertz. I just happen to have a tuning fork that is at 256 hertz. So let me hear you. I'll let you guys hear that. Okay, and that wavelength is 1.35 meters. So if we do that calculation, 1.35 times 256, that is equal to 345.6, and that's really close to what we have up above. So we would say, again, this is consistent with our speed of sound. Now, does the, do the units make sense when we multiply frequency and wavelength to get meters per second? So what is frequency? Frequency is one over the period. The period we know is a certain amount of time, time in seconds. So this is going to be, frequency is going to be one over second or a hertz. hertz. Wavelength is always in meters. And so if we multiply those together, we would get meters divided by seconds, meters per second. Now turn to page 482 with me. So we're going to be jumping between these two chapters. So it depends on the medium, right? So there's table 13.1 here, speed of sound in various media. And so we were just focusing that, um, that those problems on air, we're assuming here's in this table, air 25 degrees Celsius, 346 meters per second. That's exactly or very close to what we got in our example problem. If air gets colder, zero, we see that the velocity of sound decreases. As air gets hotter, 366 meters per second, the speed of sound is going to get faster. Now, if you think about when you're swimming, I used to swim all the time in open lakes and in Indian River where I used to live. People would always want or ask me, how do you know if a boat is coming? Well, I could always hear the boat um, in plenty of time to pop my head up, make sure that it, was, uh, it wasn't close to me or coming on the path with me, or I could wave my arms, make sure it didn't run over me. And it's, that's because the speed of sound in water, take a look at that next like, set of, um, it says liquids at 25 degrees C. Water, the speed of sound, is almost 1,500 meters per second, right? That's five, almost, or a little less than five times faster than we would have in air. And so we can also see that we, 
have the speed of sound increasing dramatically as we move into solids, aluminum, copper, and we see the speed of sound increasing through that as well. And so when we think about a speed of a wave in general, speed of sound in particular, the medium that it goes through matters, right? So remember, waves just transmit energy through a medium. The medium doesn't move, or the medium will go up and down with the amplitude. It doesn't, it doesn't travel along with the wave. The wave is transmitting energy. So let's talk more specifically about what a sound wave is. So before we talked about a transverse wave, the transverse wave here, that's our sine looking wave. Our amplitude is going to be the distance, the displacement from that equilibrium point. We have our trough, we have our crest. The distance between the tips of those crests is our wavelength. But in this case, when we're talking about sound, sound is what we call a longitudinal wave. So there exists another type of wave known as a longitudinal wave. In a longitudinal wave, the vibration of the particles of the medium is along the direction of the wave's motion. Longitudinal waves are readily formed on a stretchy spring or slinky by alternating compressing and expanding one end. And so we can see here in our picture, we have these compression areas, and then we have these areas where our medium is going to be stretched out. Compression, the stretch, the stretch is called a rarefraction, this is going to be our compression. And when, as we can see here, just like in our peak and our peak, these compressions are treated as peaks, the refractions are treated as troughs, and our wavelength is going to be the middle of those two compressions, the distance between them. A series of compressions and expans expansions propagate along the spring. The compressions are those areas where coils are momentarily close together, expansions or refractions are regions where the coils are momentarily far apart. Compressions and expansions correspond to the crests and troughs of a transverse wave. And of course, we're talking about sound here, and sound is going to be a perfect example of our longitudinal wave. So when we look at their example of sound waves in kind of the microscopic level, we will see that each section of the medium in which a longitudinal wave passes oscillates over a very small distance, whereas the wave itself can travel long distances. Wavelengths, frequency, and wave velocities all have meaning for a longitudinal wave. The wavelength is the distance between the successive compressions or between successive expansions, and frequency is the number of compressions that pass a given moment per second. So let's take a look at this microscopic depiction of sound. So he here we have a speaker. We're going to set our frequency to the smallest it can. You should be able to hear the tone, and we're going to compare. We're going to talk about frequency here in just a second. And we're going to look at the wave coming through and the particles. So this is, these are particles of air, right? Air has mass. It has volume. We know that it's mostly nitrogen, but a little bit of oxygen. So let's see what happens when we play this tone. All right. So we can see, oh, let's play that again. So we can see here in this representation, we're going to have the, the crest, this area of compression in the white, we're going to have these refractions in black that corresponds with a trough, okay? And we can see these things we just mentioned that, so as we can see, in the case of a transverse wave, each section of the medium in which a longitudinal wave passes oscillates over a very small distance, whereas the wave itself can travel long distances. So the medium that actually is going to carry the wave is going to kind of vibrate, and it's going to move into these crests and troughs, but it's not going to be carried along with the wave. Okay. So again, we see these areas of compression, refraction. And if we look at this graph as this tone is playing, what happens here at the source 
and as it travels out. Well, this is going to be an example of a dampering sing signal. It's going to lose that intensity as it travels further out. This is what we normally see with waves, right? This is not, this is a, a not, So we can see as the distance increases, that wave amplitude is going to dissipate very, very quickly. So that's the tone at this minimal frequency. Let's increase the frequency to the max and see what we do and see what happens. So we can also see that the distance, so as we increase the frequency, So let's do one more thing before we switch. Let's measure a wavelength. So at our minimal frequency, the frequency is low. We are at 141.5 centimeters for our approximate wavelength, the distance between crest to crest. So let's change our frequency here. We should see a change, right? This is the speed of sound in one particular medium. We should see the wavelength get smaller as our frequency increases. This is to maintain that speed of sound uh, velocity that we just calculated, around 345 meters per second. So here's that higher frequency. And we can easily see that our 141.5 centimeters wavelength is now shrunk quite a bit, 166. So as our frequency increased, our wavelength decreased. What else did you guys notice as that tone played? So here's the tone at the high frequency. Here's the tone of our low frequency. So we would also say that the pitch of our sound changes very dramatically with that frequency. So I just happened to have some tuning forks that I got from school and brought home. So this is a frequency of 512, and this is going to be representing our smallest tuning fork. So here you can take a listen. You guys already heard our long or our uh, shortest, smallest frequency here. Larger the frequency, the higher the pitch, the lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. Okay. And these tuning forks, we can kind of see how they're actually creating these sound waves. So when our tuning fork is at rest, we see that there's no vibration of the sound molecules. But as, as I hit with that little hammer, our tuning fork, we can see that the, the forks of that tuning fork are going to vibrate out at one moment, creating that compression. And then they're going to go back, creating that refraction. So this is what's going to create that particular wave. And due to their length, right, these tuning forks are different lengths. They're going to vibrate at a specific frequency, creating a specific pitch that we can hear with our ear. The waves are going to come in all sorts of frequencies. Our ears are able to pick up between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. This is going to be our audible frequency. If you guys have ever heard of how elephants communicate with each other over long distances, elephants are usually spread out over miles, maybe even hundreds of miles, and they can send out infrasound that's going to be of these very, very, very low frequencies. Their ears are going to be attuned to pick those up. That's something that we cannot hear. That's going to be out of our audible range. On the other side, other side, we have ultrasound, which is going to also be out of our audible range. And we have a bat <laughs> flying here. How do bats locate food? Well, they use what's called echolocation. They send out these high-pitched squeaks that are going to bounce off of food. 
So here in the in the yellow is their sonar being emitted. It's going to bounce off of whatever flying insect. That returning sound wave is going to be able to be picked up by their ears, and they're going to be able to perceive that as prey and zero in on that. We see that um, large um, swimming mammals, dolphins, and whales also use echolocation. They generally have pretty bad eyesight, and it would make sense if you're swimming through murky water or extremely dark water if you're swimming really deep. And so they also use echolocation. And of course, of course, sonar, so submarines and ships also use it. And a depth finder would also use ultrasound. And a fish finder would also use ultrasound. So these sound waves are going to be important in a lot of different applications. And of course, ultrasounds you can also see babies growing in utero. You can do checkups along the way using um, ultrasound. So as we already established, the pitch of the sound is dependent on the frequency of that wave. So there's something very strange that happens. The, the, our perception of pitch can change depending on if what is emitting the sound is moving or not. So let's take a look and let's let Sheldon of the Big Bang Theory define what exactly the Doppler effect is. Uh, hey, what's Sheldon supposed to be? Oh, he's the Doppler effect. Yes. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. <laughs> it's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. All right. So that's just a little funny for you guys. I don't know if you checked out his outfit, right? He, he is obviously coming as a sound wave, right? So his, his source is here, that sound is propagating out, at least um, in 2D. So what did he just say? He just described the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect, if you guys have ever heard a siren, a um, ambulance coming towards you and then passing you, this is what you would hear. Street. So you could hear the pitch go up, up, up. As it passes you, it goes down, down, and down. So again, a Doppler effect, an increase or decrease in the frequency of sound. This applies to anything that travels as a wave. Okay, As the source and observer move toward or away from each other. So generally, you have a stationary observer. And you have the, something that is generating the sound. So here's another ambulance. So what do you hear as an ambulance is coming towards you? So you may have noticed that you hear the pitch of a siren on a speeding fire truck drop abruptly as it passes you. Or you may have noticed the change in pitch of a blaring horn on a fast-moving car as it passes you. The pitch of the engine noise of a race car changes as the pa car passes an observer. When a source of sound is moving towards an observer, the pitch of the observer hears is higher than when the source is at rest. And when the source is traveling away from the observer, the pitch is lower. This phenomenon is known as the Doppler effect and occurs in all sorts of waves. So consider some sort of fire truck that is coming towards you. If our source, the fire truck, is moving, the siren emits sounds at, a at the same frequency as it does at rest. But the sound wave fronts, we'll talk about that in just a second, it emits forward in front of it are closer together than when the fire truck is at rest. This is because the fire truck, as it moves, is, quote, chasing the previously emitted wavefronts, and emits each crest closer than to the previous one. Thus, an observer on the sidewalk in front of the truck will detect more wave crests passing per second, so the frequency heard is higher. The wavefronts emitted behind the truck, on the other hand, are farther apart when the truck is at rest, because the truck is speeding away from them. Hence, fewer wave crests per second pass by an observer behind the truck, and the perceived pitch is lower. We have to think of the source of our sound. Remember when we looked at waves on a, on a rope, which we'll come back to when we talk about sanding waves, it kind of makes waves look like they are just passing in one dimension. But in fact, waves are propagating out in all directions from that source. 
And so what we have here is what we call a spherical wave front. And so this is going to be the edge of that wave. And as we saw in the Doppler effect, as we were talking about casing these wave fronts, when this Doppler or when this ambulance is sending out its sound from its speakers, those wave fronts are going to be piled on one another. And it's going to result in a higher perceived frequency of this particular um, ambulance. The wave fronts are going to be lagging behind as it gets to the observer. The lower frequency is going to be perceived as a lower frequency or a lower pitch, excuse me. And so when we think about the intensity of this wave, we have to think of it in a 3D context. And so in order to understand sound intensity, we have to think of this as a spherical wave front. And so this is a very good um, figure here. So the source is at the center, sound is propagating out from that source. So when we think about sound intensity, intensity is the rate at which energy is transferred through a unit area of a plane. And so whenever we talk about a rate, we're going to be talking about power. So power, if you remember, is energy per unit of time. Okay, you guys talked about that before. This is going to relate to the area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. And so this makes, this makes sense as a calculation. When we think about the intensity of a sound, as it gets one radius, it's going to equal i. But as we dissipate further and further, because we have that radius squared, we're going to see the, that sound dissipate very, very quickly. And so when we go to radii, we're going to have a difference of four, right? We're going to, we're going to square that two. And when we get out to our th three radius distance, we're going to have a difference of nine. And so we see that the intensity is going to drop off dramatically with an increase in distance from that source. So another application of sound is force vibration and resonance. So vibrations from one object can be transferred to another, causing a second object to vibrate, what we call a forced vibration. So in your book, they talk about these series of pendulums being hooked together by a rope. One pendulum starts to move because that pendulum starts to move, the energy is transferred from that pendulum through that rope to the other pendulums. We're going to see this in the case of sound breaking glass and by wind causing bridges to break. So this is again, when one vibration causes another object to vibrate. When we have, when the force vibration is at the natural frequency of the other object, that's going to cause resonance. And when this natural frequency of this other object is achieved, this is going to increase the, uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the object in motion. So we're gonna see several examples of this. The easiest example to think about is pumping your legs when you're on a swing. So you guys, as almost adults, you guys know how to get a swing going. You probably learned this when you were five or six years old. And so you know that a swing is going to act like a pendulum. You know when you're going to add the momentum from your feet, when you're going, that's going to be coming up. When you tuck your feet, you're going to be going down. Or if you are pushing a little kid on the swing, you want to push along with the natural um, period or frequency of this particular pendulum in order to increase the amplitude of that child on the swing. If you push them at the wrong moment, you know it, because that's, that energy that you apply in your push is no longer going to apply to that swing's amplitude, that child's amplitude. And so you have to find the right rhythm in order to increase the amplitude, in, in order to make that child swing higher. Okay. So this is what, that's one very simple example of force vibration and resonance. So a simple illustration of resonance is pushing a child on a swing. A swing, like any pendulum, has a natural frequency of oscillation. If you push on the swing at random frequencies, 
The swing bounces around and reaches no great amplitude. But if you push with a frequency equal to the natural frequency of the swing, the amplitude increases greatly. At resonance, effectively little effort is required to, ob to obtain a large amplitude. So breaking glass with sound. So this is also a little bit strange. You'll see in this video that this woman has to sing into this glass and at the right pitch, right? Pitch is related to frequency or at the right frequency, the glass is going to start to shake, right? At the natural frequency of the glass and it's going to break. Now, this woman, she has a little bit of an advantage because there's an inherent weakness in the glass, which is going to cause it to shatter a little bit easier than if you had a a absolutely perfect, flawless piece of glass to break. So let's watch. It's exhausting. It. Mike was telling me to try these sweeping noises up to the right pitch. So she just said, she, this guy is giving her pointers to break the glass. <laughs> And she has to get to the right pitch. She has to go through this range in order to reach the right frequency. Oh, I don't know. All right, time three. So you guys hear that? She is changing the pitch of her voice in order to find the right frequency, right? The natural frequency of this particular glass. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Dang. Don't try this at home. Right. So her voice was imparting energy right through sound. That sound was then vibrating another object, in this case at its natural frequency. So another example of resonance is going to be the creation of a standing wave and the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse. Or they called it Galvin Gertie. The collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940 occurred as a result of gusting winds, whose approximate frequency matched that of a natural frequency of the bridge, thus breaking, thus driving the span into a large amplitude oscillatory motion. So let's check this out. So the wind gusted at the natural frequency of our bridge, and it ended up oscillating back and forth. How scary would this be? I mean, that's insane, right? Can you imagine going across? This looks a lot like the Mackinac Bridge, right? Can you driving across Mackinac and having that large of an amplitude change? So again, when things vibrate at their natural frequency, Force vibrations of the natural frequency is resonant, which can increase the amplitude of the of an object in motion. So that's what was created here on this bridge. When the wind was blowing through, it created what we call a standing wave, which I'll define it here in just a second. The amplitude was so great that it eventually caused the bridge to collapse. There's no way that those materials can be that elastic to withstand those types of stresses. Can you imagine driving across there? No way. And there it goes. The total collapse of that bridge. No longer, it couldn't withhold that stress of those large oscill oscillating waves any longer, and it broke. What a crazy, crazy end to that bridge, all because of resonance. So what does it mean when we have what we call a standing wave? And this is part of chapter 12 as well. So this is on page 463. I'll show you a very brief example here um, from our wave on a string demo. So we have a certain amplitude, a certain frequency. Get this started. So let's set a reference line here. Now this is going to be a little bit different because we're going to have our, our amplitude amplified as these waves get bigger and bigger. So right now our reference line here is right at the top of that amplitude. But as these waves reflect back, we're going to 
keep increasing our amplitude, and eventually we're going to create a standing wave. So you can start to see that. A standing wave is going to be when parts of the wave no longer move. So in these green, these green little particles are going to be approximately where we're going to generate nodes. Nodes are going to be the point at which two waves cancel each other out. Anti-nodes are going to be our peaks. And those peaks are going to go here, they're going to flip around, come down here, flip back around, go up. So anti-nodes are going to be the crests, and, and, and the nodes are going to be where there's no displacement. So let's keep watching what happens. So you can see, again, if you keep, keep watching those green particle or those green spheres, they're going to stay relatively um, consistent on that orange line. This is our standing wave. Now, as we, because we have this oscillating thing, now we're going to increase our amplitude because these, all of these waves are going to be additive. So this first crest and this trough right here are going to be double our amplitude. Because, again, because of our superposition, we're going to allow those crests to be additive. But again, you can see those green dots are not going to change position all that much. That's going to be our node. Okay, so that's our example of a standing wave. This is what effectively happened on that Tacoma bridge to create that oscill oscillating motion, create so much stress and force that the bridge collapsed. All right, so the last part, one of my favorite things to discuss. How do we perceive sound, right? We have what we call our sensory organs, right? We have our skin that can sense touch, pressure. We know that we it can cause pain if you cut into it and you damage nerves. We have our eyes, we have our nose, we have our mouth. But hearing, we don't really think much about hearing. But this is what's coming into your ears as you're listening to this video, right? Or if you're listening to music. We have these sound waves from these speakers. The speaker is creating these compressions, the refractions, these longitudinal waves are coming into your outer ear, passing through what's called our external auditory canal and reaching our eardrum. Our eardrum is going to be connected. This is going to be just like our membrane here. So speakers are going to be be a piece of electronic that is going to be a membrane that vibrates okay, according to whatever signals is being sent by the computer, our eardrum is going to be vibrated by those sound waves coming in. We have three tiny, tiny bones in our ear that are going to help amplify those sound waves coming in, okay? So this is going to be a membrane. We amplify our signal and then we get into our inner ear, okay? Let's see what that looks like. So again, this is just a very brief overview of how we can translate pressure waves into signals that our body can, or that our brain can perceive, okay? We know that not all things that we hear come from our ears, right? And we know that certain mental illnesses, people hear voices, that's the difference between what we actually can produce mechanically from our ears and what our brain perceives as, um, as sound, okay? And so our brain does all sorts of things. Perception is certainly a very interesting topic if you get into neuroscience. Anyways, so here again, here, is our, here are our three tiny bones. These pressure waves are, going to, are going, basically going to pound on what's called an over oval window. This part of your cochlea, maybe you guys have heard of your the cochlea before in your middle ear. The cochlea is this tiny little shell-shaped organ right here. So those sound waves are going to be transferred into this liquid in there, and it's going to go around that shell-shaped area, and it's going to vibrate what's called the tectoral membrane, okay? So there's going to be those vibrations from the air amplified here, 
passed and transferred into this liquid here is going to vibrate this tectoral membrane. Now, as we look at the very smallest unit of our um, hearing sensory, this is the tectoral membrane. And what's going to happen are these little tiny hair cells. This is going to be, these are going to be very, very sensitive. Um, these are going to be the cells that, that are going to create signals that our nerves can carry to the brain. And what's at the end of these little hair cells are these little projections. These are the hairs of the hair cells. And what's going to happen is that these hair cells are going to be gently or not so gently bent back by the vibrations generated from the sound waves that traveled into your ear, okay? And so this, um, this membrane is going to vibrate. These hair cells are going to bend. When the hair cells bend, they're going to create nerve impulses that travel to your brain so your brain can perceive sound. Now, how do you lose your hearing? There are many, or there are a couple ways to lose your hearing, but the most general way, the way that we have to look out for it the most, is the bending and damaging of these projections on our hair cells. Listening to music too loud will damage these little projections here, okay? And this is irreversible damage. This is why older folks have hearing loss is because their hair cells have been broken down over time and they no longer transmit those signals. So make sure that you turn down your music, protect your hair cells.